It's, uh, since I mentioned uh, Edwards Air Force Base, uh, naturally uh, we're going to have a quick look at Edwards Air Force Base, where we saw a couple of hours ago a truly spectacular dawn over the desert. Looks pretty good there right now, doesn't it, uh, Gene? Well, let's hope they don't have to use that uh, landing site out there for a few days, but yeah. it sure is a pretty day. Ken Kashwahara, our correspondent at Edwards, has been standing by just in the event it would uh, have been necessary for Columbia to land at Edwards, and they did have that capability. But, Ken, uh, you're not going to see any shuttle uh, landing today. Uh, we hope not, Frank, and <laughs> we hope it'll be uh, next Tuesday if all goes according to schedule. As you saw, it's a beautiful day out here. The, the weather forecast for this morning, at least, is, is fine. Just a few scattered clouds up above, as you saw. But one thing that concerns the, we the weather people here is, is the weather. There's a storm sitting up off the Pacific, and in fact, it's over northern California now. And about six hours from now, uh, this entire sky out here is expected to be covered by clouds. Um, NASA officials here were worried that the, the further into November we get, the more likely we would have uh, a possibility, rather, for a storm coming in. Right now, the long-range forecast, although it's not uh, exactly accurate, calls for clear weather on Tuesday for the scheduled landing of the, uh, of the shuttle. Everybody here is ready, and as you mentioned, uh, um, this is where Joe Engel trained, and people here are very excited about that, all, many of them having known him back then. The train, uh, the chase planes, as you saw, are, are ready. The convoy has been standing by for some hours and is, is still out on the lake bed in the event that the shuttle had to come down here for some reason or other today. Everybody is ready. All of the rehearsals are completed. And uh, this time they are hoping to refine their procedures once the shuttle comes to a stop here and get the astronauts out in about 27 minutes as opposed to uh, more than an hour last time. Frank? All right, thank you, Ken, and we'll see you out there uh, on Monday. Actually, I guess we're going out on Sunday. I'm going out on Sunday and uh, be there on Monday and Tuesday for the, uh, for the landing, which, of course, is spectacular in its own way to see that bird come down and realize where it's been, zooming around and around and around. Right now, the, uh, the spacecraft is over Africa and will enter darkness, as I understand it, uh, over the uh, Indian Ocean to be able to see the, the Earth in darkness. Frank, we have to wait for our day to end, for uh, noon time to come and the sun to progress to the west. But uh, for Joe and Dick today, they're going and seeking their own nighttime. Uh, uh, they're probably uh, four or five o'clock in the afternoon right now in, in their day because that's the time zone over the Earth they're on. When they first get in orbit, uh, they're, it's almost like high noon over the Atlantic and they're looking uh, at a very reflective ocean, very bright ocean. And of course, they can see a fantastic, beautiful curvature of the Earth, a horizon. And, the next thing, I, I'm just trying to project their feelings. Uh, they'll see his land for the first time again since they left home. And they'll see the coast of, uh, of Africa. And that truly will be an exhilarating experience for them. And then, uh, generally, there's no clouds over Africa, over northern Africa, the desert. And they can see the Ajax Mountains, the Sahara Deserts, the things that are so vast that we read about in history books when we were kids. They're going to be 100, 130, 150 miles above the Earth looking at the entirety of that continent. And it's, it's going to be, I, I'm excited for them. They have well a continent-wide view, don't they? Yes. yes. And then Tell me, uh, Gene, if I may uh, ask, how, uh, how easy is it to identify, given clear conditions? How easy is it to identify things like, for example, Gibraltar? Uh, See that? Yes, you can. It's easy because they study their landmarks. They're, they're, they study the topography and the geography of the, the, this Earth. And uh, uh, one thing, though, it's, it's very difficult to get lost in space. And by that, I mean if you, if you can identify a known landmark, you can progress to another one, uh, up a mouth of her, up the Mississippi River. You can find then places along the Mississippi. Uh, you can find even cities, St. Louis and what have you. Could but you spot cities, really? Uh, he, oh, yes, you can. And so yes, forth. you can. But when you first look down uh, at some of these landmarks, unless they're prominent, like Gibraltar or like uh, the Peninsula floor, this kind of thing, you have to find your way. You have to sort of, sort of find where you are visually uh, down there, and then you can work your way up and you say, there's Lo Lake Okeechobee or or there's perhaps uh, the China Wall, which some of us have seen from space. But the wall itself? Yes. You were able to identify You can track the shadow. If the sun is right, yeah. if the sun is right, you can track the shadow. But you have to have some landmarks which to work your way along on the surface of the Earth. Thank you, Gene. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, they're doing a lot of tracking at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and we're going to go there now to Steve Bell. Steve? Frank, uh, what hasn't got a lot of attention, publicly at least, is that when the first of the space shuttle flights went up, the trajectory was not what the computers had said it would be. It was all right, it just wasn't what they had expected. And so the officials here at Mission Control were watching very carefully today to see what the chain was going to be. 
Uh, astronaut Joe Allen sitting with me. Joe, what happened? What happened, uh, Steve, as best I understand it, was nothing today. It went right up the mathematical trajectory. Uh, we called it the last time lofting, and uh, the Capcom told John Young and Bob Crippen, you're lofting during the first ascent of Meaning the space shuttle. Meaning it went shuttle. up at a steeper uh, It angle. went steeper. Today it went right up uh, the trajectory as expected, and I suspect we may have a bit of a mystery on our hands as to why it behaved properly today. All right. Did they do anything differently because of we, the uh, trajectory the first time? Uh, we did. We, because we didn't understand the problem, we corrected it halfway, which is to say we told it to go up not uh, just a little bit more shallow. All right, here we have astronaut voices. Let's pick up mission control. Well, we're... Uh, we are coming on uh, acquisition of signal through the Indian Ocean Station. Processing data now through Indian Ocean. All right, was that mission control? And that was, uh, that was mission control, we heard. Dan Brandenstein will try to call Columbia. He yeah, is calling Indian right Ocean now. Station. Uh, configure AOS. We have you for six minutes. There they are, back in control now, back, you also. back in uh, touch with the uh, mission control here. And Columbia, I have uh, Ohm's propellant pad, uh, the uh, crossbeat queue for you when you're ready to copy for your Ohm's too. Getting a little feedback on this signal coming from space over the Indian Ocean, would you believe? We have uh, about six minutes uh, remaining on this path. Okay, uh, it's, uh, for your cue card, it's the uh, Crosby Q, uh, it's uh, 45... What they're talking left. about is coming up on an on Ohm's right. burn. This will be another burn of those onboard rockets to put it into the final perfect orbit they're hoping for. And uh, Al Dale recently uh, put together a uh, piece for us that uh, explains to us exactly how these Ohm's burns work in space so that we get into the proper orbit that the shuttle is looking for. The two orbital maneuvering engines are located in separate pods which rest on either side of the Columbia's aft fuselage. These engines provide the thrust necessary to insert the Columbia into final orbit, to alter the orbit as required, and to slow Columbia down for re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Each engine provides about 6,000 pounds of thrust, only about an eighth as much power as an engine on a 747. They can be reused on at least 55 shuttle missions without a major overhaul, and then 55 more times. They make the shuttle a working space vehicle, a manned machine that can maneuver within limits where it wants to. Thank you, Aldale. We're now back at uh, Houston listening to Mission Control, talking with the astronauts now over the Indian Ocean. No transmission at the moment. Uh, I've got to give Joe Allen credit for this, although I'm going to steal it from him. Uh, they'll be crossing the international date line in just a moment. So, uh, truly is almost truly certain to have the shortest birthday on record. <laughs> History. Mission Control here in Houston, back in touch with the shuttle astronauts as they're preparing now for that final Ohm's burn, which will come in just a couple of minutes, uh, hoping to put the shuttle orbiter into a final and perfect orbit to make it a full go for the five-day mission. Everything so far going just beautifully. And our coverage of uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia continues in just a moment. 